sweet outfits, immortality, and superpowers. God Tier is essentially a turbo leveling state accessible to players under special circumstances, and it comes with several unique perks. The most obvious is that it seems to grant the player increased influence over their aspect, that the player can exert most effectively through the verbiage implied by their respective class. A player whose title means Destroyer of Souls will play quite differently from a Changer of Wind, who will in turn look quite different from one who can steal Void. But there are certain boons all god tiers will receive. For example, regardless of hero title, all god tiers gain the ability to fly. The transformation might also come with some biological upgrades, since achieving god tier is partly a symbolic realization of who the characters really are. Troll mythology, for example, puts a strong emphasis on metamorphosis, and produces a cultural ideal of adulthood as linked to fairydom as a result. Humans have similar cultural ideals, but none with so biological a focus. So they don't get fairy wings. They can still fly, though. They also get sweet magical pajamas, known as godhoods, with hoodie pockets and everything. The jammies' design will be based on the player's class, color scheme will be based on their aspect. The outfit is strictly optional, and the player can even alchemize their outfit to achieve a number of styles and effects. Players who reach Godhood can also level up past the top of their Echa Ladder by climbing the God Tiers. The player stops receiving boon dollars for leveling up because, and I quote, that shit is for babies now. Instead, the player's Kitty Camper Handy Sash will receive new badges upon level ups. These badges have a variety of effects that increase the player's mastery over Homestuck's metatextual game mechanics. For example, the Gift of Gab allows players to talk face-to-face -face through dialogue logs, or the Universal Specibus Badge, which lets players wield any weapon without needing the correct specibi. Finally, God-tier players have the advantage of conditional immortality, meaning they can't die unless they're killed. And even then, the death must be either heroic or just in order to stick. Otherwise, they'll simply resurrect shortly after dying. The judgment on whether a death is heroic or just is defined broadly, mysteriously, and according to the case of the individual. A heroic death might result from an act of self-sacrifice or martyrdom, while a just death might occur if the individual is directly responsible for terrible things, or if they've been corrupted by a villainous influence. So, pretty sweet perks all in all. But they're not exactly easy to get to. To go god tier, a player has to find one of two quest beds hidden in their session, marked with the symbol of the aspect they are bound to. The player must lay down on this bed, and then perish. This process is referred to as taking a legendary nap by the consorts, as the first version of the player's quest bed will be found on their native planet, and will be linked to a corresponding bed somewhere on the battlefield at the center of Skya. A player can only die on this bed if their waking and dream selves are both alive, and this method will result in the waking and dream selves fusing into one being. This is how the players are meant to reach Skya for the first time. Or, if either the waking or dreaming versions of the player are dead, the player can seek out their quest crypt, stashed away in the core of their dreaming moon. If the player dies on this bed, they will simply resurrect on the spot. To gain this incredible power, the players have to undergo a messianic death and resurrection, reaching the symbolic point on the hero's journey where the hero recognizes his own mortality, but is willing to face it for a greater cause than himself. A brutal request to put on the shoulders of a teenager, but it's not mandatory, or at least, not by design. The trolls practically dominated their session despite the fact that only Vriska officially made the god tier. And, okay, here's where we need to get real for a minute, because I'm about to challenge what is, in my opinion, one of the biggest misconceptions of the hero title system. And that misconception is the idea that the players are granted their powers by Spurb. This reading of Homestuck tends to lead to two big problems. One, it encourages the reader to ignore the period of the player's life before they entered Spurb. Two, it leads the reader to understand versions of characters who 
don't reach god tier or don't develop flashy powers, as failed versions of their titles who don't tell us anything about their class or aspect behaviors. In my view, classes describe instinctual behaviors that players default to, for better or worse, that they engage in in various ways throughout their lifetimes. In my opinion, some of the most important ways players leverage their class specs are in their interpersonal relationships, not their superpowers. What's more, as we have characters in the comic who haven't god-tiered, yet are more effective with their aspects than players who have. Compare Jake English, who goes god-tier but doesn't actually come into his powers until years later, to Gamzee or Terezi, who both perform cosmic level feats without being god-tier. This even extends to players who haven't actually played Spurb. Her imperious condescension doesn't have a Spurb-given title herself, but an alternate version of her plays Spurb as the Thief of Life. The Condus herself, again, never becomes a player, but still she's noted to have powers somehow related to life, including the ability to extend lifespans to match her own. And over the course of her life, she performs several actions that parse easily as theft through life, or theft of life, as her title's verbiage would imply. The distinctions between aspect and class also lend themselves to situations where we can assume a character might have certain power sets even if they haven't quite developed them yet. Sticking with the Condes, the ability to extend life is a bit counterintuitive for what we would expect of a thief. And that power has limits. She can extend life, but not restore it. Knowing this lets us make certain assumptions about another life player, Jane Crocker, whose abilities outstrip the Condes' in this regard, since she can restore life when it's lost, both for herself and others. Since the power to extend lifespans fits much more naturally with the idea of a creator of life rather than a stealer of it, we can reasonably assume that given the time and ability to practice, Jane could likely develop this ability, though we haven't yet seen it done in canon. This is one of the many advantages afforded by the open-ended verb system that the classes rely on, and there's at least one case where a player uses their hero title powers to achieve some kind of immortality, despite not actually being god-tier. Gamzee's sudden inability to die, despite not being god-tier, definitely keeps him alive even as it fills up with confusion and rage. And thinking of god-tier powers as metaphorical rewards for reaching enlightenment puts Homestuck squarely in the tradition of its namesake, Earthbound, which follows a group of kids on an adventure to save the world. Through the use of psychic powers, Earthbound's protagonist, Ness, reaches enlightenment close to the end of his journey, which substantially boosts his stats and psychic powers. Hiveswap's characters are described as bound to their particular aspects, so the source of inner strength and psychic ability in Homestuck and Hiveswap's universes is already linked to Earthbound. And we can think of the aspects themselves as sort of elemental flavors for the same core psychic ability. The fundamental power of every individual to use their heart, mind, and willpower to change the world. god tearing might be an efficient process for understanding and harnessing this power, but it seems to me Homestuck implies anyone can get there with enough hard work and introspection. So I'm very interested in seeing how the psychic powers of the heroes and villains in Hive Swap grow and develop. I hope you'll come along with me on that journey. I hope you feel you've learned something interesting from this video, and most of all, I hope you had fun. Thanks for watching. This video exists thanks to the support of my wise cohort of patrons. If you'd like to summon more videos like this onto your screen, then you can join them. Also make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you never miss another video. That's all for now. Until next time, keep rising.